In a previous video, we looked at how Europe first fell behind in semiconductor manufacturing, as well as how Japan successfully caught up to the leading edge, passing Europe along the way. The attempts talk about Japanese semiconductor ascendancy during the 1970s and 80s opened European policymakers' eyes to just how behind they were in semiconductor production. In 1980, European producers had just 13% market share of world semiconductor sales. From 1981 to 1985, that percentage edged towards 10%. In 1985, Europe's biggest semiconductor producer was Philips, ranking 10th in the top 10 leading manufacturers. Two-thirds of their production came from their American subsidiary, Signetics. European companies were largely dependent on imports. In 1985, 58.7% of total European semiconductor consumption was imported. None of Europe's top four semiconductor manufacturing countries were self-sufficient. I can go on, but you get the point. These statistics were concerning. In response, the European community tried a series of pan-European policies throughout the 1980s to revive their semiconductor manufacturing industry. In this follow-up to my European semiconductor video, I want to take a closer look at the European community's attempts to win back the semiconductor industry during a very important time, its last real chance to do so for the next three decades. But first, let me talk about the Asianometry Patreon. Early access members get to see new videos and select their references for those videos before their release to the public. It helps support the videos and I appreciate every pledge. Thanks, and on with the show. Before we begin, we should consider why European governments wanted domestic semiconductor production in the first place. Semiconductors are critical components in all IT products. Semiconductor advances have helped enable whole new industries to emerge, such as consumer electronics, personal computers, gaming, and AI. They also enable some of Europe's most important industries, including cars, planes, and industrial electronics. Advancements in these fields often begin with advancements in their microelectronic components. One of the biggest reasons why Europe first took up the issue of prioritizing semiconductor production in the 1970s was the belief that their IT makers were falling behind in the world markets because they lacked direct access to world-class chips. The most important such market was the next generation of computer systems. In the late 1970s, everyone was talking about the potential that very large-scale integration systems, or VLSI, had on the economy. These new class of incredibly powerful computers and many other such advanced devices can only exist because of the increasing improvements of advanced semiconductor products. To take a modern example, can a country produce the next groundbreaking chat GPT-like innovation without access to the most advanced NVIDIA GPUs? Probably not. Furthermore, continued European dependence on foreign imports was not only strategically threatening, it reduced Europe's control over the future technology roadmap, but it also threatened the industry's prestige. The semiconductor industry in Europe faced several challenges. Firstly, Europe's lead markets are missing several big drivers. Semiconductors are components that go into bigger systems, and so they are heavily shaped by market demand. There are only so many big demand markets out there. The big ones back in the 1970s and 80s were computers, telecommunications, industrial, government, and military. Europe never managed to develop many of these big demand markets. Their automobile and industrial markets are great, but their computer companies lost to IBM. Their military markets are nowhere as big as America's, and their telecommunications is highly fragmented. As a result, the composition of Europe's semiconductor industry reflects that lag. Japan and America had strong share in integrated circuits, leading edge chips essential for VLSI production. Europe's production, on the other hand, was in discrete or analog chips, more mature stuff. From the end of World War II to about the 1970s, European countries tried creating national champions across a variety of fields. The policy logic differed per the industry, but in the case of computers and semiconductors, European policymakers believed that their native players needed more scale to be competitive with the Americans. Governments nurtured these national champion companies with preferential procurement policies by public agencies and R&D subsidies. Unfortunately, as it turns out, many of these national champions were uncompetitive outside of their home market and core competencies. Policymakers underestimated how just hard it was to make these arranged marriages work out. Don't believe me? 
Just look into history and try to see how many big M&A deals end up working out. Most of these flashy deals end up destroying rather than creating value for their stakeholders. Why should we expect a government-arranged deal to work any better? Furthermore, these natural champions found themselves subject to their government backers. This means direct interference in order to preserve certain political goals. One notable example is the British government's insistence that British technology stay in British hands. And finally, the national champions too often ended up falling victim to their darker natures, splitting the market between one another. That is what happened in France. Two tech giants, Company Générale d'Electricité, or CGE, and Thomson, arranged their own Yalta agreement in 1969 and agreed not to compete with one another in certain areas. That is not ideal. Most of the most prominent national champions in European semiconductors were SJS in Italy, Thompson in France, and Inmos in the United Kingdom. SGS and Thompson merged in 1987 to create SGS Thompson. The combined company also later acquired Inmos. Today, SGS Thompson is known as ST Microelectronics, and they're actually doing quite well today. In 2022, they generated $16 billion in revenue and turned a $4 billion profit. Their core markets are in automotive and microcontrollers. Regardless, ST Microelectronics' mild success is no indication that the national champion policy works. TSMC made more revenue and profit in its fourth quarter 2022 than ST Microelectronics made in the entirety of 2022. After the widely acknowledged failure of the national champion policy, the European community tried a new direction. This change was driven by Belgian Etienne Davignon, the newly appointed European Commissioner for the Internal Market. In 1983, the EC launched the European Strategic Programme for Research and Development in Information Technology, or ESPRIT, projects. The logic behind this policy was that Europe remains quite strong in academic research capability. However, their industry has a harder time bringing that research into the market. They need to do more of it, too. European R&D lagged that of Japan and America, 2% of their GDP as opposed to their 3%. Furthermore, companies competed with one another, causing wasteful and duplicative efforts. In 1979-1980, Davignon got together the leaders of Europe's 12 biggest IT and electronics companies. They briefly discussed the idea of creating a European Airbus for semiconductors, but instead settled on the idea of a pan-European research collaboration. Esprit sought to transfer advanced technologies to European companies and get them to better cooperate with one another. The ultimate goal being to achieve semiconductor parity with the United States and Japan in 10 years. Esprit funded projects from all types of businesses and universities regarding advanced technologies, manufacturing tools, and international standards, mostly, but not always related to microelectronics. To avoid running afoul of trade competition laws, no near commercial products were funded. The EC policymakers at the time saw Esprit as one of the two elements to a larger policy the second being the creation of a single market, a unified European market that would improve their company's competitiveness. Did Esprit work? In some ways, yes. There were some encouraging results. European companies improved their technological competencies, working more closely with one another rather than a foreign partner. Esprit also spawned innovation in areas like millimeter wave communication systems, material technologies, and fiber optics. This success inspired other programs specifically for telecommunications and biotechnology. Unfortunately, the research technologies were often too far up the development chain to make any real impact on the market, and while subsequent rounds of ESPRIT tried to address this, few technologies eventually came to market. Furthermore, while a significant number of projects went to small and medium-sized businesses, the majority went to the Big 12 firms who met with Davignon. You can see the potential issues associated with that. And then we have the Eureka Initiative, first proposed by France's President Mitterrand in 1985. This was largely a response to America's Strategic Defense Initiative, which was an ambitious plan to shoot down ballistic missiles. People in Europe doubted the initiative's ability to actually do what it said it would. They were probably right. However, they did recognize that it can fund a lot of commercial technology widening the European technology gap and encouraging brain drain to the United States. 
so Mitterrand proposed Eureka with the goal of creating a technological Europe. Unlike the Esprit projects, Eureka projects focused on products that were closer to commercialization. But soon after the idea came up, policymakers spent the next year wrangling over the project details. The project also expanded to include a variety of governments outside of the EU, including those in Central and Eastern Europe. Many people criticized Esprit for being a public larges spending program, that it spread public resources too thinly across too many technologies and hooked private companies on government subsidies. I don't think Eureka did anything to dissuade that criticism. By 1997, there were nearly 1,200 ongoing or finished Eureka projects at a total value of 16.7 billion euro. A significant portion of that was tied to the Joint European Submicron Silicon Initiatives, or JESSE, a failed initiative to create leading-edge DRAM chips. I also mentioned JESSE in my previous video on European semis. Remove JESSE from the picture, and what you find are a bunch of small, underfunded projects, where accountability and transparency are somewhat difficult to find. Countries with large domestic markets, like France, had long reserved part of that market for their national champions. But smaller countries, like the Scandinavian and Benelux countries, do not have that luxury. The European community sought to spread those protections across the entirety of the area. Francis Thompson argued for higher tariffs on foreign electronics imports to protect the domestic consumer electronics companies who consume their microelectronics products. The EC complied. In 1986, they raised tariffs on video recorders, or VCRs, to stem a surge of Japanese imports though they also lowered tariffs and clock radios and calculators as a concession to Japan. They also lowered the tariffs on finished imported semiconductors from 17% to 14%. But this mattered little, because EC tariffs on finished wafers not yet cut into chips were 9% throughout the whole decade, encouraging foreign manufacturers to just import finished wafers and do the packaging onshore. Then, in 1987, the EC brought its own anti-dumping case against the Japanese dram industry. An agreement was eventually negotiated in 1989 to create a price floor. But Europe's computer makers, the dram consumers, were strongly opposed to the deal. They wanted the lowest price for this critical component. This led to further wrangling until 1990, when the Japanese finally agreed to self-implement price limits. However, by then, the Japanese semiconductor decline was already well on its way, and the Koreans were starting their climb towards the memory summit. So, despite all of these policies, Europe's share of the global semiconductor market refused to budge and, in fact, deteriorated throughout the 1980s. By decade's end in 1991, European producers' market share had fallen to about 10%, and it has remained 10% in the three decades since, though I suspect it is today far lower. This decline was for several reasons. Over 80% of European semiconductor production came from West Germany, France, Italy, and the United Kingdom. But over the decade, those countries' national champions experienced big changes. West Germany had once been Europe's semiconductor leader, but their production began declining in the second half of the 1980s, thanks to the worsening competitiveness of their national champion Siemens. Meanwhile, Europe's one globally competitive electronics company, Philips, ran headlong into a financial and managerial crisis. This eventually brought down one of the world's electronics pioneers. If you want to learn more about that, I recommend TechAlter's recent video on the topic. Elsewhere in Europe, foreign takeovers of struggling national champions, like that of ICL by Fujitsu, made it ever harder for policymakers to enact policy. They wanted to limit EC support only to European companies, but without new entrants, such things were becoming increasingly rare. Perhaps it was for the best, though. Many of these old electronics giants had long lost their edge. The 1984 Mega Project, in which Siemens and Philips came together to produce a leading-edge DRAM, made that painfully clear. The 1980s turned out to be a critical time period in semiconductor history. It was the last open window for the Europeans to gain and build ground. The first big event of the decade was the fall of the Japanese semiconductor industry, the reasons for which are long and multifaceted, and I won't get into them here. Second was the rise of both the Taiwanese and South Korean semiconductor giants. Samsung began taking share from the Japanese in 1986, 
and TSMC was founded in 1987. Third, the 1980s saw a titanic technological shift in semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Intel failed to master the latest lithography machines, steppers, and stagnated from 1979 to 1985. Yet in the end, despite billions of euros spent and a plethora of research done, European semiconductor manufacturers failed to take advantage. Samsung cornered the memory market, Intel cleaned up with the PC CPU, and TSMC shut the door on the rest of the industry with their independent foundry business model. Europe's sole shining light, the lithography machine maker ASML, sells all of its production to Asia and the United States. In the 1960s, European industrial planners thought why America succeeded was because their companies, like IBM, were so big. So they sought to make their own national champions as big as IBM via merger. This turned out to be wrong. The reason the American tech industry succeeds so well and is capable of so much dynamism is how it allows small companies to grow big. Policymakers in the 1980s knew this, yet their new policies still could not break themselves from the big companies. Their continued attachment to those big companies failed them, as those companies slowly turned to dust. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.